This is Money Track. Your guide to investing and protecting your money. This is Money Track. Everybody, welcome to Money Track, the show that proves you don't have to be born rich to wind up that way. I'm Pam Kruger. And I'm Jack Gallagher. Now, maybe you think investing is way over your head, but today's show is going to change all that. We'll take you to Maryland to meet a man who figured out how to turn literally a few dollars a month into a fortune. And no, he didn't buy into one of those get-rich-quick schemes or use sophisticated tactics. Now, this is a show about money and Wall Street, but we like to find real people who can teach us real lessons. And this man's story will make you smile and make you think. Money Track reporter Matt Markovich takes us to Baltimore now. Not long ago, I met Earl Crawley. Hey, how you doing? But everyone here Welcome calls him Square. Mr. Hey, Earl. We can talk about some finance. <laughs> He's worked as an attendant at this parking lot in Baltimore for 44 years. So you really think it's going to improve the game? Funny thing, right? though, everyone was asking Mr. Earl about money. Nickel and dime, nickel and dime. That's right. Is that booth his pulpit where he's preaching the gospel of investing? Sure is. Okay. He makes my day every time I see him. Oh, come on now. Seriously. Investing? How you like that gold now? 607. Earl told me he's never made more than $12 an hour. Never earned more than $20,000 a year. How you doing? So how could he know something about corporate profits? I had to pry. So Earl, what's your net worth? A half a million. Half a million dollars? Yeah. From working here? Working here. That's amazing. My last statement. And there it is in his statements. Over a half a million dollars net dollars. worth on a parking lot wage. Now Mr. Earl had my full attention. How did he do it? Stop working so hard and let the money work for you. Earl's first lesson came at age 13. His mother had him working the fruit stalls to help pay the family bills. He got to keep just a few quarters for himself. From the time my mother started taking money, taking my money that I earned at Alexis and Market, that uh, it wasn't uh, money just to be thrown away. It was there to be used. Economics aside, Earl had another obstacle to overcome. Tebow is. Uh, he tells me he's dyslexic. Back in the 50s, that meant settling for a life of low-wage manual labor jobs. So Earl figured he'd better sock away what little money he was making. It was just a dollar here and a dollar there, starting with saving stamps, and that led to savings bonds. At 26, he got married. And by the late 60s, Earl was feeding three children on a meager $80 a week. It was tough, but because we had to sacrifice a lot. And the budget only got tighter when Earl and Beverly opted to send their kids to Catholic school instead of public school, which was free. Earl took extra jobs to pay the tuition, and you better believe he made every penny count. Elementary school, I would ask for lunch money, and he would give me a dollar, and lunch was 85 cents, and he would reply before I walked out the door, I want my change. <laughs> As the years rolled by, Earl kept saving what seemed like meaningless amounts. He started investing $25 each month into a mutual fund and did that consistently for 15 years. By the late 70s, his net worth was $25,000. Later, as, we, as the children got older, he decided to um, play, I call it play the stock market. And he bought one share, and well, the rest is history. <laughs> he bought stock in blue chips like IBM and Coca-Cola that paid dividends and... Instead of uh, taking the dividends and pocketing it, let it set or let it reinvest itself and it increased my shares. And the more shares I had, the more dividend I had, eventually the more money I had down the road. So where did this so-called slow learner learn so much about mutual funds and blue chips and dividend <laughs> reinvestment plans? Going to split this, this year. It all comes back to that parking lot. And this is my favorite part of Earl's story. You see, his lot is smack dab in the middle of a financial district where he picked the brains of brokers and bankers and lawyers for their financial advice. What's going on? You got any advice for me today in the markets? No, I'm just trying to find out something from you. Oh, all right. Talk to everybody and listen to uh, advice that everybody give me and take it from there. Earl, why don't we take a look at what you've got in the portfolio now? Earl had trouble reading, so instead, he listened. 
He believed in the power of compound interest and stocks for the long haul. Which brings us back to the present. Today, Earl's stock portfolio alone is worth more than half a million dollars. And yes, his house is paid for. And no, he doesn't carry any credit card debt. He's somebody to emulate not only as an investor, but as an individual and how to live your life and, and uh, make the best of, of what the Lord gave you. Now, Earl is paying it forward. Here comes Brenda. He's gifting shares from his portfolio to people like Brenda Thomas, who never dreamed they could have enough money to invest. And that was Coca-Cola. Because you told me to reinvest uh, my dividends, I now have 77 shares. I'm excited about it. I wouldn't, ha I wouldn't have it if it wasn't for Mr. Earl, and it, he made it so easy. If you don't have the money for it, And not only shit, is he gifting shares to a local no church, he's starting an investment club there to get everyone invested. Our goal is every member of the church will own stock, and then we're going, they're going to transfer into their family members, so starting here, it's just going to blow up. It, it makes me feel good to see someone actually uh, going on and, and took my advice and went on and did it. And that's a, uh, really a good feeling. So from his little green shack, Earl is helping others and preaching the gospel of investments. And at the end of my day with Mr. Earl, he told me his good fortune happened not in spite of, but because of his disability. I always used to say that I must have been the dumbest thing in school or the dumbest thing to uh, couldn't learn. But God gave me the gift to uh, to um, listen and act behind it. And uh, it's one of the best things I've had to me. Questions, anyone? Well, exactly, Pam. It's nothing short of astounding that Mr. Earl is teaching us how simple it really is. And I put the emphasis on simple because unlike you, Pam, who has worked as a stockbroker, I don't have that experience. I am, however, at a point in my life where I'm interested in learning how to become a better investor. So that story touched me on a bunch of different levels. Oh, me too, and it's true. I do have a background in the financial services industry. But I have to tell you, I've never met any one person I could learn as much from as Mr. Earl. He challenges us to rise to the occasion, and he says, if I can do this, anybody can. Then he takes it to the next level and shows us how to give back. All of this while he's struggling with dyslexia. Mm -hmm. True, and, and it occurs to me that Mr. Earl's income is less than what most of us pay for our cell phone bills every year. That is so true. You know, sometimes I think to be successful investing, all we really need to do is get out of our own way. It is behavior. That's the whole key. Why do we make it so hard for ourselves? Well, let's dig a little deeper into this with someone who really understands what it takes to be a successful investor. Pat Terrion is a professional money manager and teaches portfolio management and finance at the University of Connecticut. Hi, Pat. Now, you just saw Mr. Earl is as real and as down-to-earth as it gets. And then here you are coming from this world of complex mm -hmm. and very sophisticated financial strategies. What do you make of Earl's success? You know, Pam, I think it is amazing that uh, uh, what Mr. Earl has done, uh, and especially without any formal, formal training, and it shows that it can be done just about by, by anybody, Pat, what does this man have that the rest of us don't have? I think Mr. Earl uh, first has a lot of patience. And uh, I think another thing that he does is he listens. And he, I think he developed these, uh, these traits when, when he was challenged with dyslexia. And in his case, your greatest weakness becomes your greatest strength. And uh, his dyslexia, I think, created an, an environment or created his personality, that, an investment personality that helped him. It's patience and listening. Note to self, patience and listening, good traits for investing. But I still don't know how Mr. Earl found the money to invest on $12 an hour. That took a serious commitment, right? Uh, he's even said it's all nickels and dimes, nickels and dimes, uh, and let the money work for you. And Mr. Earl thinks a lot like the great investors that I've studied. All great investors are disciplined. If you look at Warren Buffett or you know, Peter Lynch, they were extremely disciplined in the way they looked at uh, investing and the way they looked at companies. You could see that uh, every penny counted. He would give his son a dollar uh, for lunch and lunch cost 85 cents and he expected his 15 cents back because that 15 cents, you know, every day was the 15 cents that went into buying a share of Coca-Cola over time.
Pat, I am fascinated by his thinking process. I mean, he really took the time to figure out which companies would still be around over 30 years. He thinks multidimensionally, uh, which is very, very rare in an individual, and it's very important for investing because when you have, when you're dyslexic, you have a tendency to to look at things backwards, and uh, you have to relearn and actually look at things then forward. So in the end, you end up looking at all angles of you know at something both forward and backwards. It seems like he doesn't jump into things on impulse, which I know is a trait of smart investors. You could see it just the way he is in his parking lot. Uh, he sits there and he thinks of different types of companies that he'd be interested in. He thinks it through. Uh, he asks a lot of questions of people that are in his uh, the park in his parking lot. He has a good feel if they're experts or not. He asks brokers. He asks business analysts. Um, and then he gets a consensus opinion, and that's that multidimensional thought process. And that helps him when he invests. Hey, Pat, I'm also incredibly impressed that he wasn't intimidated by what he didn't know. He insisted on learning to do his own research, and you can just imagine how slowly he had to take right. it. Mr. Earl thinks independently. Mr. Earl doesn't follow the crowd. And you can see that. That's why he's, that's why he's wealthy. Pat Terrion, we're really looking forward to hearing more from you when we dive into how Mr. Earl invested his nickels and dimes in just a little bit. But first, we're going to hear from Ben Stein, who has studied economics and has written a number of books on investing. That's right. Now, Ben is at his favorite deli in Beverly Hills right now. And believe me, he has his own take on Earl's rag to riches story. Ben? Mr. Earl is properly motivated. Mr. Earl decided he did not want to be destitute. He wanted to be able to put his kids to school. He wanted to have a decent, comfortable life. And so he took the trouble to set aside a specific amount of money each month. He took the trouble to learn about investments. And he took the trouble to not only create a plan, but to execute on the plan or to execute the plan. And therefore, he got it done. We should be inspired by Mr. Earl. Mr. Earl should be on a postage stamp. You know, that's not a bad idea at all. I wonder if he thinks Alan Greenspan should have his own stamp. Don't know. But thank you, Ben. Hey, why don't we test your knowledge right now? A little trivia, our Money Track investor quiz question. That's right. Now, Money Track reporter and Matt Markovich actually have that question all queued up. Hit it, boys. Okay, this week's Money Track quiz question is Which one of the following legendary investors made a billion dollars in just one day? Earl? Peter Lynch, Warren Buffett, George Soros, or John Bogle? That's right. Okay, so take a guess. Well, it has to be Warren Buffett. You think so? Well, we're going to find out just ahead. But we want you to know that if you would like to learn more about anything you're seeing on today's show, just head to our website. That's right. We have a website. Check out our own very miniature Labradoodle, folks. The address is moneytrack.org. And actually, Chloe is the webmaster. Well, we all want to be successful investors. We want to think that we can make our money work for us. Now, Mr. Earl's story is so clear and simple that we can't help but learn a vital lesson, that it's our attitudes about investing that make us wealthy or not. That's right. And he shows us that the process of investing does not have to be complicated. Yeah, it's that calm, steady, persistent approach that's taken Earl Crawley from poverty to total comfort. Now, I want to know more about how he put his money to work and where he invested most of his money. This is the part of the show that Pam and I like to call Investing 101, because frankly, for most of us, it helps to get back to the basics. And each week, we invite a guest professor to join us. In this case, Pat Terrion is back with us. Pat, welcome back. Mr. Earl created a simple system to make himself wealthy on $20,000 a year. And we've talked about the traits that Earl has that other great investors also have, his personality with the patience and the discipline. But I think a lot of people watching this are asking, can it really be that simple to make money investing? Uh, Pam, I think it uh, has a lot to do with people uh, wanting to get rich too fast. Uh, the road to wealth is... Uh, it should be a slow road. It's like the, uh, the tortoise versus the hare. So let's take his life story apart in the investing sense. Number one, he's always lived within his means, so he saved. And the very first investments were in? In basically U.S. government bonds. Uh, because he knew they were safe and he wasn't sure. He wanted to think, think things through. And then he went out and invested in quality companies that he understood. He understood the business and he could project the business out for many years. Um, and he ended up being very patient. 
which is, again, all these are counterintuitive because what people want is they want to make a quick dollar and they don't want to, they don't want to wait. And then in the 70s, Pat, we know he bought mutual funds so he could spread out his risk a little bit in, by investing in other stocks. And, and by the way, if you missed that decade, the stock market in the 70s was a pretty dismal place to be, pretty much flatlined almost all of those years. But Mr. Earl hung in there. And, and finally... The market went up in the 1980s when Mr. Earl's um, son was uh, probably in, in high school and in college, probably the very times that he had to pay for you know, private school. And yet what's amazing is he didn't dip into his principal, the money that he had made and that was going up you know, during that time frame. And Pat, he stuck with the high quality stocks that paid dividends, and this is the key, he reinvested those dividends all those years. Stocks like Coke or IBM. Now, we are in no way recommending that everybody go out and buy Coca-Cola stock. In this case, it's just part of Earl's story. Exactly. But isn't there another very famous, hmm. legendary investor we've all heard of who also liked Coca-Cola stock, Pat? Yeah, Pam. Uh, Warren Buffett owns uh, his holding company, Berkshire Hathaway, owns over 8% of uh, Coca-Cola stock. And, and actually, he bought it around 20 years ago. So Mr. Earl and Mr. Buffett were buying Coca-Cola you know, just about at the same time. And they recognized the, the opportunities to buy a, a great company like Coca-Cola and hold on to it for, for many years. I have a, a little tidbit for you, or a question for you and Jack. If you bought Coca-Cola stock in 1919, just one share at $40 uh, when it first came public, what would it be worth today, that one share at $40 with reinvested dividends? Well, I have no idea. I'm going to say with the dividends reinvested, maybe $250,000, one Excellent share? Excellent guess. That's what I was going to say. Oh, come on. What is it, Pat? That one share today would be worth $4.5 million. That is unbelievable. Amazing. Mm. Yeah, I have something about Mr. Earl that is a rare uh, ingredient uh, in most people, is Mr. Earl cares. Mr. Earl cares about, uh, you can see, others before himself. Uh, I think he cares about the companies he invests in, he, that he gets close to them. Pat Terrion, thank you for helping us see the world of investing through Mr. Earl's eyes. Yeah, thanks very much, Pat. Now, remember that quiz question that Matt asked with Mr. Earl earlier? Yes, I do. And in case you've forgotten, the question was, which one of the following legendary investors made $1 billion in just one day? Was it Peter Lynch, Warren Buffett, George Soros, or John Bogle? And the answer is? OK, Pam and Jack, the answer is George Soros. Ah, I'm going to be on that list next. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. After everything we've seen with him, I don't doubt that he'll be oh, on that list. Me neither, and I want to know him then. Well, if you want to know more about how to buy just one share of stock and then reinvest the dividends just like Earl did, watch this. Head to our website and click on Money Minutes, and you'll see I'm taking you to an online brokerage firm that caters to small investors called ShareBuilder. Step one, open a brand new account, and it can be an IRA. Just fill in the blanks. Once you've done that, you can start with as little as you like. I suggest starting with $50 to $100, though, so that the fees aren't too high relative to your investment. Say you want to buy just one share, but of what company? Well, even if you already know, you can't do enough homework, remember? That's what Earl did, so click here on Research. Step three, indicate how often you want to add to this investment. Now, I chose the 15th of every month, so ShareBuilder automatically deducts $100 from my checking account. Another way to buy one share and let those dividends ride is go directly to the company whose stock you want to own and click on their investor relations area. Hundreds of companies now let you buy their shares without using any broker at all. You know, that's pretty cool. And it's also cool that we have a, a Labradoodle here with us. You know, Pam, I honestly never realized the connection there is between making money investing and our behavior. You know, I, I guess I always thought it was about being lucky or just finding out some great tip at the right moment, uh, which, of course, never seems to happen in my circle of friends. <laughs> and we do, of course, know that our behavior occasionally causes us to make really stupid decisions. On some level, we all know that the hot tip 
rarely ever really pans right. out. But we want to believe so much that there's a deal out there, and I'm going to get in on the ground floor, and nobody else is going to know about it. Well, it does make you wonder how very educated, smart people wind up buying into really insane money-making schemes. Now, I just filed this report on one such scheme. You won't believe it. Watch this. Yes, $60 a barrel oil is pretty scary. And you worry about global warming. And doesn't it seem like everybody out there's got a monster truck? So, you want to invest your money in green energy. Doesn't that just sound like the right thing to do? I'm going to save the planet. I'm going to invest in the future in hydrogen. I'm going to give all my money to a con man. We issued an investor alert about uh, oil and gas and alternative energy scams this summer. Missouri Securities Regulator Matt Kitsey says the rush to invest in so-called green energy alternatives has created an ocean of opportunity. And that means you know who will be showing up. There's no question that uh, scam artists and people who are looking to turn a quick buck will uh, prey on and take advantage of the fears of the general public. In Idaho, a company known as Genesis World Energy claimed to have invented a breakthrough fuel cell that could power a household for 20 years using only a single bathtub full of water. Investors lined up for the chance to write checks to founder Pat Kelly, who was later charged with three felonies. His so-called Edison device turned out to be awfully similar to a hobby kit sold by Hamica Schlemmer. Around the country, dozens of miracle energy schemes have popped up, most claiming to have some sort of hydrogen breakthrough. But real scientists know it's just not that easy. We'll see many people uh, advertise that they have come up with the solution. George Zverdrup oversees hydrogen research at the nation's top alternative energy lab in Colorado. And he says our transition to a bathtub-powered economy is sadly not imminent. Because we are evaluating all of the different options to move to hydrogen, and we know what the technical challenges are for each one of them. But if parting a hydrogen atom from an oxygen atom remains difficult, parting a fool from his money is still surprisingly easy. In Missouri, investors poured $100,000 into a startup company that claimed to be on the verge of producing a car that could run on tap water. Seriously, tap water. Now, you'd think the story had a happy ending because Matt Kitsey's folks were able to shut the company down and get all the investors their money back. But some of them didn't want to be rescued. They truly believed in the aqua car. And Kitsey says their angry reaction wasn't all that unusual. And what's probably at the root of that is, is that the folks that are, um, that are perpetrating these scams or promoting these investment opportunities, as they probably stated, um, are good salespeople. Uh, anybody can call our investor protection hotline and make sure that the, uh, that the security and that the investment is actually registered with our office. You know, if I had not seen that with my own eyes, I wouldn't have believed it, Jack. You know, Pam, I feel for all the victims in every scam that we cover, but this one is so out there. It is honestly just really hard to relate. Well, I want to remind all of you that you can learn more about common scams like this one and get much more on our star of the show today, Mr. Earl. That's all on our website. That's moneytrack.org. <laughs> Please don't go to moneytrack.com because bad things happen that involve a, a butane lighter and a fire extinguisher. So. <laughs> Let's just recap the main points, shall we, of what we want you to walk away with today. Maybe the most important lesson is from Earl's simple story. Mr. Earl used what he had mm -hmm. to get what he wanted. And remember, this is a man who achieved total financial security on less than $12 an hour. And he also showed us that it's possible to gain confidence in something we feel we know nothing about. Mr. Earl amassed a small fortune starting from nothing. He didn't try to become an expert in every aspect of the stock market. He made it big because he researched every stock and mutual fund he wanted to buy, and he did it carefully. And whenever you do have an impulse to buy into an alternative fuel vehicle, which could be a good idea, 
just stop and think about it and then think about Earl and remember how difficult it must have been for him to take his time and read everything he invested in with such care. Now we hope that you will always, always investigate before you invest. And we also hope that we've inspired you to start thinking about your own money in a whole new way. Hey Pam, you will never have to buy gas again. Why are you torturing me? <laughs> I, uh, Why do you torture me? <laughs> Bye, everybody. We'll see, see you, you next, next time. time. Teasing me I'm again. Sorry. I won't do it ever again, I promise. <laughs> it's the last time. Look, Godzilla. <laughs> well, it has to be Warren Buffett. Mm. Mm-mm. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. See, then you could pull into the gas station and say, fill it up with bottled water, <laughs> if you had a really nice car. <laughs> Sparkling or flat? My car only runs on Perry. This Wait, I'm sorry, I was saying the alphabet. Did you hear how good that was? <laughs> yes. What does this man Wait, have? Wait, I'm sorry, I was panting. That was good. Stripes. Stripes. That was it's definitely in the days. Days. And I'm still wearing plaid. <laughs> <laughs> and navy. I like this one. That's a great picture. I thought you was like a, a gerbil baby. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody, and welcome to Money Track with the emphasis today on the track. I'm Jack Gallagher. And I'm Pam Kruger. Today's program is all about the mad race to riches, and we all want to increase our odds of winning, don't we? Mr. Earl has never earned more than 12 bucks an hour. That's $20,000 a year. Yet through investing in the stock market, he's amassed over half a million dollars. And his advice? Stop working so hard and let the money work for you. Kruger. Pam, it's for you. It's Ben Stein. Kruger. He's saying people are going to need more than they think they will. Ben? Ben? Can you hear me now? Pam. Talk to him when you're done. <laughs> Jack. The average savings per household, it depends on who you talk to about it, but are something between fifty dollars and $100,000. Uh, that is not going to yield enough income for people to retire on. Hi, I'm Andy Bissell. I was so much in debt, I decided to move into my truck and save all that money that would normally go to rent instead went to credit card payments. So how can anybody like Andy, with his stuff in storage, living out of his truck, trying to pay off credit cards, ever think about investing? We're going to show you that he already has everything it takes to wind up a millionaire. Today we have a question from Dorothy. She's at Cafe Portofino in Boone, North Carolina. I have all my money invested in CDs at the bank instead of the stock market. Isn't that okay, having CDs in the bank? Why should I have all that risk in the stock market? When the stock market is at its peak, optimism is at its all-time peak as well. And that's when you want to buy. On the other hand, what happens when the stock market hits a low? Pessimism is rife. And that's when the temptation is to sell. That is not a good idea. <laughs> Eventually, you won't have any money left. We know from after hours trading that your fans are jumping on your tips the very same day that the show airs. So I wonder how much homework they're really doing. Now, we don't believe in buy and hold on mad money. We believe in buy and homework. I tell people that if you have the time and inclination, you should spend, you should spend one hour per week per position knowing everything. But realistically, you think that's the case? <laughs> In Missouri, investors poured $100,000 into a startup company that claimed to be on the verge of producing a car that could run on tap water. Seriously, tap water. We have learned an awful lot today. Bullets, please. One, to preserve the family assets, please, parents, understand the kids may not work it out later. Talk to them about it right now. And kids, adult kids, your inheritance should not be your retirement plan. Heather. Heather. That is our show for today. We hope that we've helped you think about your own life after you retire. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching from the beautiful shores of New Seabury here on Cape Cod. That's it for this money track. The whole secret with the pyramid is at the bottom, your real low risk stuff, and then as you go up, uh, bigger and bigger risk till you get to the top. You don't want to have a lot. Are you listening to me? Are you? Look at me. I tell you this stuff all the time and you don't listen.